Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see everybody here in your smiling faces. Even though it's raining out, we should still be smiling, right? You know, the rain makes it kind of like dismal, but hey, we've got the love of Christ in our hearts, and we will be happy and rejoice. Is this working? Can you hear me okay? I don't think it's well, but I'll talk loud. Our announcements today. Funeral for Vince on November the 7th at 2 o'clock at the church. That's here. 2 o'clock on November the 7th. Lunch and to follow. Our condolences to Christine and the family. And uh, you've, you've heard that Vincent passed away. And uh, my, our dear brother. And I've been praying for Christine. Let's keep her in our prayers. Our prophecies of hope, discovering Daniel and Revelation. Starting this Monday, November the 1st, we will be having a study of Daniel and Revelation in a different format, that of a seminar or discussing setting. Pastor Cusack will be sharing based on years of study in this area. We will be using several resources, including Mark Finley's Understanding Daniel Revelation, Stephen Bohr's study materials, and others. We will move at a slow pace to give time for reflection and to really see aspects of these books that add to one's existing knowledge and to see the importance of these books to our Christian experience and character at the end of time. This will be an opportunity to study these books as you may not have before. Please come, bring friends, and prepare to receive a deep blessing. That's this Monday it starts, okay? We will begin a Bible marking class on November the 6th at 2 p.m. November the 6th at 2 p.m. Sunday, November 14th at 6.30, Taste of Health meetings will begin again. We will have a presentation of boosting your immune system using Dr. Rodriguez's book, Pandemic Busters, a prepper's handbook showing simple and easy immune boosters that you can do at home. The book will also be available for purchase at a bulk rate. We are told to follow the science, but on occasion this has been a challenge as we learn new aspects to the pandemic. This will present what can be done to strengthen the immune system in terms of nutritional therapies, herbalism, hydrotherapy, and lifestyle considerations. And that should be a really good um, class. So you wanna to come to that Sunday, November 14th at 6.30. PA Conference, new address, 2359 Mountain Road, Hamburg, PA. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Okay. If there's no other announcements, we will start with our opening hymn, Does Jesus Care? Hymn number 181. <laughs> Dreary, I know my 
heaven we thank you that truly we have someone who cares for us lord we ask now that as we come into your presence that the spirit of your comforter may come and abide with us speak to our hearts guide us into your truth and transform us more into thy image we ask and pray in jesus name amen So now time for our tithes and offerings. Get to the page here. It is for a local church budget. John and Nellie had lost their jobs because of downsizing. They were living on unemployment. However, as they were applying for new jobs, they had an idea. Let's volunteer for the church community service program, John suggested. Nellie agreed, we can use this gift to spare time while we're job hunting to serve others. Their own difficulties seemed few when they opened their eyes to the needs of the community. They saw parents struggling to feed their children, to pay for their rent, and to get proper clothing for their kids. They understood because they too were in a similar situation. They learned compassion. As the days turned into weeks, their hearts changed. And when the Lord opened doors of opportunities and both went back to work, they saw with different eyes. And when the time came for offerings, they gave to their community service program. Not only that, but when, they, when there were holidays, rather than taking all the time off for themselves, they continued to volunteer to serve others. We might not always have monetary resources to give to a ministry, but we can give our time, our hands, and our feet. We can touch the lives of others for God's glory. This places the, uh, this places the, scriptures, the scripture verses in a new light. But lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is... There will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 20 and 21. And now will the deacons come forward.
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege to return to you your tithes and offerings, Lord. We thank you for the privilege to serve you in this way. We ask that you will bless the gift and the giver, and may this money be used to further your gospel into all the world. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Now it's time for our praise. Praise time. What do we have to be thankful for today that the Lord has done for you this week? Shout it out. Waking us up every morning. What a beautiful thing. A new day has dawned and God has given us another day of life to serve him, to trust in him. What else? Yes, Ruth. Yes, we've had a lot of beautiful sunshiny days. Nice warm weather last week, a few days. It was beautiful, wasn't it? Oh, phenomenal, the colors. God is such an artist. I got to tell you, you just reminded me. Yesterday I had Carly in the car and we were driving through the mountains and she goes, oh, what beautiful colors the trees are. What beautiful colors. She goes, there are rainbow trees, she said. <laughs> and that, that was just so cute. But the... The, yes, the colors are, are beautiful out there in the fall. So, and I thank God for the colors. It is a beautiful time of the year. What else? Anything? Yes, Julie. For our health. For our health. Amen. I praise God for the health that we have. Without Him, we wouldn't have any. Yes, Bonnie. Praise the Lord. Your foot is not hurting. That's good. It's getting better. Praise the Lord for that. Any others? I have something to share with you. Got a few things. Yesterday, I'm going to tell you because it just happened yesterday, about 5 o'clock. I was on my way home and in a car up ahead was trying to get in the driveway and there's some branches that had fallen off the tree onto the road and blocking it. So they had to go all the way around and block out the road and then get up over the driveway. I drove past and I, and I, and I looked and, and the Lord impressed me to turn around and come back. So I turned around and I came back and parked along the road there and I helped the guy move these branches off the road. And he was very thankful. Very thankful. So we had to talk and, okay. And I tell you this story because I want you to, to see something. This man was talking to me. He says, I, we're from New Jersey. We moved here. We're from New Jersey. And the house that was there was his, his mother's house. His father had just passed away not long ago. And they were looking. You know, they're from New Jersey. And he's talk, talking to me about New Jersey. And he says, are you familiar with this town? I said, not really. And he told me about a theater there. And he goes, are you familiar with that? And I'm like, no. He goes, it's a Jehovah's Witness theater. And he goes, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. And so he had no fear of telling me his faith. He shared it with me, okay, willingly. And he nice and easily talked his way right into it. And I said, wow, well, that's great, you know. And we got to talking, and, and I talked to him about the tree and so forth. And I put in his driveway. I said, let me put in your driveway, and we're going to talk. Him and his mother came over, and they asked me about a scripture, if, if I knew it. It was Psalm 83, verse 14, you know. I said, well, not offhand, but I said, I got my Bible right here, right there. And he goes, oh, really? I was like, yeah, let me turn to it. He goes, would you read it for me? And so I read it. I read it, okay. And it had, a, and, you know, let me just turn to it and read it, because so you know what I'm talking about here, okay. It's Psalm 83, and... 14. So I pulled out my Bible and then I read to him I'm sorry it was 18 not verse 14, 18 He goes that men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth So he's rubbing in the name Jehovah to me 
I said, yep. I said, but you see that little one next to Jehovah there? You look down to the translation, it says it's translated as Lord. Lord. Okay? So I made that clear. He didn't think of that. And then they turned to Daniel. They asked me to turn to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. I said, oh, that's the image of Nebuchadnezzar, the dream of the image and the, and the, and the nations and the rock coming down to smite the nations and hit the feet and destroy the kingdoms of the world. But in that verse, it says to set up, God's coming back to set up his kingdom and it shall not be given to other people. Well, they were trying to tell me that, oh, a whole bunch of stuff. But anyway, long story short, uh, they were telling me that the rock's coming down to destroy the wicked but the houses and stuff are not going to be destroyed. Everything's going to stay the same. But God's going to set up his kingdom on the earth. And so I, I said, no. I said, when Christ comes, he's going to destroy all the wicked with the brightness of his coming. But I, I, they were starting to like have a little argument with me. And so I stopped arguing. And I said, and he told me about this rock coming down. It's going to destroy the kingdoms. I said, yeah, but that rock is Christ. Jesus is coming back soon. I said, so no matter what. I told him, Jesus is coming soon, so what we need to do is be ready for his coming. And they said, yes, yes, we need to be ready for his coming. But the Lord had opened that door for me to witness. Well, I'll tell you what, they would not take one bit of literature that I had, not any book, not anything at all. I tried, trust me, I tried really hard, and they wouldn't take a thing. But they tried to give me their stuff. I said, no, nah, no thanks, I don't want your stuff. But I just want to tell you, they had no problem witnessing about their faith. No problem. We need to be that way. We need to be that way. Okay? Did I see your hand? Yes, Bonnie. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So they, they are forbidden to do from, from their church. So. They, they wouldn't even take Hacksaw Ridge, by the way. No. They wouldn't even take that. Nothing. They, they just won't, they won't do it. One of the verses that I like to use that I've heard in the past that was used for, I think it was Isaiah 43, it says, I am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. Yes. So if Jehovah is the Savior and Jesus is the Savior, then Jesus is God. Amen. But Amen. It's really only the Holy Spirit that can go ahead and uh, break through to uh, the people. Amen. Thank you, brother. That was awesome. Any other praises? Always be ready to give an answer, right? Yeah. Always be ready. Well, I just to share all sure, sure. My name is Bill Springer. My sister Susie Woolley has lost her husband. Okay, okay. So I'm sorry, to yes. The, the service next Sunday. So um, I believe that the Lord, you know, it's, it's sad that Jane passed away, but mm. you know, it's worked out everything. Yes. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Just, uh, keep her in your prayers, you know. And, uh, she just has a hard time, mm. you know, just if you come, you know, just even saying I'm sorry or whatever, I know it would be difficult for her. So yes. just try and it will. just say, you know, say we love you or something like that. And she just has, she just can't talk a lot of times. So she's really uh, grieving. Yes.
And, and your, your first name again? My first name is Bill. Bill, Bill. Okay, Bill. Thank you, Bill. We will keep that in prayer because our, we're going to do our prayer requests now, and that's going to be one of them for sure. Any other praises before we move into our prayer requests? Okay, prayer requests. We're going to remember Christine. And these ten pastors. And pray for the service next Sunday because uh, some of her, some of Vinny's friends from the railroad should be here. And I'm hoping that you know, we'll be able to share the gospel and okay. you know, share some things that will help them to realize, like you said, the Lord is coming very soon. Yes. out those details then and um, so any other prayer requests yes Danielle Caitlin okay do you Julie Emily I have been remembering her other prayer requests Ruth Your son's your son's daughter. Okay. Son in law. Yes, Chelsea. Jillian? Okay, we will. Any other prayer requests? Sure, Bill. Okay. Prayer requests? Yes, Ruth. Your children. Okay. Any others? I know we have unspoken and our missing members we will remember. All right. If there are no others where it's possible, let us kneel as we pray. Thank you. 
Our blessed Lord, we humbly bow before you, Father, bringing our prayers and our supplications before your throne of grace. We ask, Lord, for you to hear our prayers. We pray for Christine, O oh Lord, that you would comfort her in her time of mourning the loss of Vincent, her husband. We pray that you would draw close to her and comfort her and ease her pain and suffering, Lord, according to your will. And we pray, Lord, for our brother Bill, who was over in Kenya and preached powerful words of God, and ten pastors are now converted. We pray for these ten pastors of the Pentecostal churches. We ask that your Holy Spirit will work in their hearts, that they will be truly converted unto thee and preach the word of truth with faithfulness, Lord, and power, and that many more will be converted unto thee. We thank you for the work that you are doing in other parts of the world and here in our own country. We ask that you would just continue to do this, Lord, and strengthen your people and the faith of your people, that they would preach your word of truth with the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for Vinny's service next week, for many people will be coming that work with him and that knew him. We ask that you would open their hearts right now, Lord, and prepare them to receive your word of truth as Bill preaches to the people and gives us words of hope and comfort through Christ. We ask that you would do this now, Lord. We pray for Caitlin. You know her problems, Lord. You know her struggles and the temptations. You know her. We ask that you would guide and direct in her life and work a miracle in her life, Lord, and work out all things for good, we pray. We pray for Emily and her family. You know Emily, Lord, and the pain she suffers and the problems. We ask, according to your mercy and your will, that you would heal her, that you would ease her suffering and pain, and that you would work out all things for good, and that many people would draw, be, close, be drawn closer to you, Lord, through this pain and suffering and learn to trust in you. We pray for Ruth's children, Lord. You know each one. You know their struggles. You know their hearts. We just ask that you would draw them close to you, that they would learn to trust in you, Lord. We pray for Ruth's son's daughter and her son-in-law. You know the problems there, Lord, and they are deep, and we ask that you would work out all things. Convict their hearts and lead them to repentance, Lord may they be converted unto you. We pray for Chelsea's friend, Jillian, whose dad has passed away. We ask that you would comfort her, Lord, in this time of mourning and the whole family, that you would work out your will in her life. And we pray for Bill and for his children and for the silent prayer request that he has. We just ask that you will work in his children's lives, Lord, and just guide them and direct their paths in the way of life and the way of Jesus and keep them safe. We pray for Jeffrey. He's working on his master's degree. You know the problem there and you know the struggles. You know his desires. We ask that you will work out all things for good for him and that you would just continue to guide his steps. We think of all the church members, Lord, who are not here today. You know the reasons why. You know those who suffer and are in pain. We ask according to thy will that you would heal those who are sick and ease the pain of those who suffer and comfort those who mourn. For you are the great and mighty counselor and the prince of peace. Give us your peace, O Lord, we pray. And now as we move into the church service and our brother David brings the bread of life to us, we pray that your spirit would speak through him. And open our hearts and minds to receive your word of truth, Lord, with gladness and readiness of mind. And that we would search the scriptures. That we would draw close to thee, O Lord. Feed us now through your word. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>
Our scripture reading is Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And the Bible says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word today. Brother David. Thank you, Jeff. Let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for another Sabbath day, for the privileges to come before you and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we ask for your spirit now to be with us. I pray you speak through me to the hearts of your people. May you be uplifted and I be hidden behind your cross. Again, we thank you for this privilege to come. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. King David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The title of my message this morning is Identity Crisis. Identity Crisis. Would you say that in the world today there is an identity crisis going on? What are some things that you can think of that pertain to an identity crisis that we see in the world today? Just list off a few things. Gender. Anything else? Marriage. Anything else? Family. How about in the church? How about in the church? Say again. Theology. Theology. Anything else? I want to read a statement to you, and then I'm going to go into my point about this. You know, because if you read the Bible, the Bible very um, seldomly deals with the world. It is primarily dealing with the Christian church. Would you agree? It says, many who call themselves Christians are mere human moralists. They have refused the gift which alone could enable them to honor Christ by representing him to the world. The work of the Holy Spirit to them is a strange work. They are not doers of the word. The heavenly principles that distinguish those who are one with Christ from those who are one with the world have become almost indistinguishable. The professed followers of Christ are no longer strong, a separate and peculiar people. The line of demarcation is distinct. The people are subordinating themselves to the world, to its practices, its customs, its selfishness. The church has gone over to the world in transgression of the law, when the world should have come over to the church in obedience to the law. Daily, the church is being converted to the world. Christ Object Lessons, page 315, paragraph 3. You know what I call that? I call that an identity crisis. Our church, not just our church, but the evangelical world as well, is in the midst of an identity crisis. What does the word identity crisis mean? According to the Oxford Dictionary, a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people what? Perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he so the question is when did our identity crisis as humanity begin go to Genesis chapter 3 we all know the story Genesis chapter 3 when did our identity crisis begin as humanity Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 the Bible says now the serpent 
was more subtle or crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, he spoke unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Verse 4. After the woman responded, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What did Satan do to begin the thought process of deception? What did he do? Yeah, he insinuated that God was number one lying and he really did not mean what he said. And the second thing he did, he insinuated that God was withholding something from Eve which would make God what? A liar or selfish. God was being selfish. And what happened next? Well, first, Eve believed the words of Satan over the words of God. Then she persuaded Adam to partake of the fruit as well. And for the first time, they saw each other in a different way and knew, the Bible said, or perceived that they were naked. And then what came over them? Once they realized what they were, what came over them? Fear, shame. And what did that shame cause them to do? Well, that was after. What did it cause them to do? Before they hid, what did they do? They made fake garments. They covered themselves. When you fall into sin, do you immediately want to go to God? What is the thing you want to do? You want to try to cover up. You want to try to provide for yourself. We call that self-medicating. We want to try and heal ourselves. After the shame came the guilt. So they hid themselves from God. Now I can just imagine they're in the very presence of God anyway, and here they are trying to hide from their creator. So they hid. But what was God's response? Did God respond in the way that maybe they were thinking? How do you think they thought God would respond to them? Anger. When we were bad with our parents, what did we do? We thought our parents would be what? Angry with us. But the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 1, My ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways and your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sin, when we fall into it, does something to our identity. What does it do? And where is our identity found? We need to understand where identity found, our identity is found first. Our identity is found in Christ. But when we sin, what do we do? We separate ourselves from Christ. Isaiah 59, 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have hid his face from you. His iniquities have hid his, your iniquities have hid his face from you. God doesn't hide his face. Our sins hide God's face from us. So God's response, Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 8 and 9 says, let's go there here, Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called Adam and said unto him, Where are are you? You know, when we understand truly who God is, we won't want to run from him. When we understand that God is seeking us, the Bible says in Jeremiah, 
that I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I am doing what? I have drawn you. God is seeking to draw us. The Bible said it is the goodness of God that does what? Leads us to repentance. If God had responded in the way that they thought he would, they would never have come to him. And we need to be careful as Christians when someone does something wrong that we don't lay guilt trips and shame and things like that upon them. We need to love them. The Bible says only by love, is Ellen White says only by love is love awakened. Fear is never going to draw someone to Christ. It's never going to do it. In Desire of Ages, she says a legal religion or a legalistic religion is a loveless, Christless religion. Loveless, Christless religion. God came seeking for them. And he does the same for us. Romans 2 verse 4, I read it early. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that it is the goodness of God that leads thee to repentance. And then Romans 5 verse 6 and 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And then verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. While Adam and Eve were in their shame, in their guilt, trying to self-medicate, God came and met them where they were. Not only did he meet them where they were, he provided a way of escape. And he gave a symbol of what he would do. This is taken from a book entitled Patriarchs and Prophets. And it says, Such has been Satan's work from the days of Adam till now. And he has pursued it with great success. He tempts men to distrust God's love. To do what? To distrust God's love and to doubt his wisdom. He tempts us to distrust God's love and to doubt his wisdom. And by the way, it's not just one day he does it. He does it every single day of our lives. You can be in Christ and the devil will still tempt you. Why? Because he knows if he can get you to take your eyes off of Jesus, he can get you to believe his lies and doubt the love of God. So my question is, next question why is our identity under attack? And when are we most vulnerable to Satan's attack against our identity? When we are children, listen to this, Satan knows that if he can influence us at a young age to doubt our Savior's love, he will be successful in making us have a skewed conception of God's love. At a young age, Satan tries to get us and who are to be the reflectors of God's character to children? The parents. If the parents are mean, always yelling, always angry, abusive, what is the child's view of God going to be when they grow up? Angry. God's angry. God hates me. God doesn't love me. God must think I'm stupid. Parents have a responsibility to reflect the image and the character of God to their children. I want to ask you, what do you think is the world's greatest need today? What does the world need today? Peace? Jesus? A vision of Jesus? Say again? Let me see Jesus? Anyone else? Love. A sermon of what? A sermon in shoes. I want you to I want you to know I agree with every one of those things especially Jesus. This is taken from a book called Education 57 paragraph 3 and some of you may have heard this statement before. The greatest one of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. 
men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. And there is a man like that, and his name is Jesus. But he also needs other men and women to step up and be the same way. The biggest thing, in my opinion, causing our world's identity crisis, and Satan is very, very crafty. Let me ask you a question. What gender did he attack or has he always gone after from the very beginning? The men. Why? Who? The, the male was supposed to be the promised Messiah, right? He was, right? Moses' day. Who did he try to have killed off? All the men. In Jesus' day, what did he try to do? All the male children under a certain age. There has been a constant attack on men. And it's on women too. Just in a different way. But if you look at some of the television shows today, some of the quotes that you see on uh, Facebook and things like that, and you know, we may think they're funny, but there's a subtle degrading of men. Happy wife, happy life. Have you heard that one? I agree that the wife should be happy, but shouldn't the husband deserve to be happy too? I believe happy spouse, happy house. I saw a quote on Facebook. I, I saw a quote on Facebook that said, Men, men to the left because women are always right. It's this subtle putting down of men that they don't know anything. There's television shows where the men are pictured as stupid and the women know it all. Do you see that in society? Yes. And it's true. And so what do we see in a lot of uh, hurt women today? Men are stupid. Men are dogs. Men are worthless. The constant put down. And I want to read to you some statistics here because it's very important. I believe there is a father absence crisis in America. It says here there is a crisis in America according to the U.S. Council Census Bureau. 18.3 million children. And out of that 18.3 million children, one in four live without a biological, step, or adoptive father. Out of 18.3 million children, one out of four will live without a father in their home their entire life. And it says here, consequently, there is a father factor in nearly all of societal ills facing America today. Research shows when a child is raised in a father absent home, he or she is affected in the following ways. I'm going to read them to you. They're four times greater to have poverty. Seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teenager. More likely to have behavioral problems. More likely to have abuse and to face abuse and neglect. Three, two times greater risk of infant mortality. More likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. More likely to go to prison. Two times more likely to suffer obesity. More likely to commit a crime. And two times more likely to drop out of school. These are what statistics say can happen when a father's presence is not in the home. A woman was not meant to do it all. I don't care what society says. They were not meant to do it all. That's why God made husband and wife. He said in the beginning, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a what? Help me for him. A helper for him. And there may be some of you in this room who grew up without a father. I grew up without a father. And it does affect us. But I want those of you to know. One of my favorite Bible verses is Psalm 27 verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Psalm 68 verse 5 says that God is a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widow. That is God, who God is in his holy habitation. There is an attack on the male head figure in the world today, and not just in the world today. We have an issue in the church that's arisen. I'm not going to get into it. Most of you can study it out, and most of you know what it is. We are not saying that women don't make good teachers, but God has given everyone specific roles, and we are not to try and usurp those roles and think we can do it. 
What did Eve believe? If you read uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, when she partook of the fruit, the Elamite says she felt she went into a higher state of existence. And you know what Ellen White calls women and men who do those kind of things, but specifically women who believe that they need to be higher than where God made them? Modern, restless Eves. They're not content with the role that God has given them. They feel as if that's beneath them. They can do better than what God has called them to be. And on the flip side, it is true that men have not always been good examples We've not always been what God has called us to be. But be patient with us. Be patient with us because we're all growing, we're all learning, we're all healing. So what are the tools or other tools that Satan uses to cause us to have a confusion in our identity? Well, in Matthew 10, 36, Jesus says, no, sorry, excuse me one second. Matthew 10, 36 says, And a man's foes shall be they of his own what? Household. Satan uses family to cause us to have an identity crisis. What else does he use? Paul says in Romans 12, verses 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then John says in 1 John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and of the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Satan uses our family Satan uses our world for us to try and determine what our identity is. How about our sins and shortcomings? Revelation 12, verse 10. What is he known as? Revelation 12, 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. Why? For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Have you ever wondered why you can't sleep at night? Well, maybe it's because Satan is there accusing your conscience. I have a saying that I saw one time, and it says, if you can't sleep, don't count the sheep. Talk to the shepherd. We need to learn to do that more. If you can't sleep, talk with the shepherd. How about in Zechariah chapter 3, 1 to 5? It says, and I heard, excuse me, man. Zechariah, remember the, the story? Zechariah standing before the angel of the Lord, and who's on the right hand? Satan. And what is Satan doing? Accusing Zechariah. But what does the Lord do? The Lord rebuke thee, Satan. And then what does he say? Take his dirty rags off of him. And put on clean clothes on him. God wants to put clean clothes on you. God wants to give you a new name. God wants to set you in your true identity. And what is our true identity? We are children, sons, and daughters of God. What else does Satan use to cause us to have an identity crisis? Have any of you ever been disappointed by people in the church? Satan's most successful agents are unconverted Christians. Satan's most successful agents are unconverted Christians. I have been disappointed from people that I look up to. But now God is teaching me we are not to look up to man. We are to look to Christ. Men are going to let you down. But God will never let you down. I've been told to shut up by people in the church. Is that acceptable? No. But it happens. Unfortunately, we gossip about our brothers and sisters in the church. Does that happen? It does. We slander one another. We make insinuations about one another. By the way, that's what Satan does. And it's not right. 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 says... 
having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And then he says, from such turn away. Do not associate your pe yourself with people who claim to be Christians, but act like worldlings. Do not associate yourself with those people. There are people in our church who know our standards. They drink. They smoke. I've seen it. I have friends I went to school with. They know the standards, and I don't know what happened along the way, but now they're living in the world. They don't care about God. They don't keep the Sabbath. God is not in the forefront of their minds. And what is one of the problems? Verse 7 of 2 Timothy. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, we hear things like, I've been in the church for years. I heard someone tell me this a little while ago. David, we've been preaching Jesus has come, and he's still not come yet. So is it God's fault that Jesus isn't coming? No, it's not. Whose fault is it? It's ours. We are told in Christ's object lessons that until the character of God is perfectly revealed in his people, Jesus will not come to get his people. We preach, and I hear all the time, when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world, we view the gospel as just preaching it, talking about it. But it's more than that. Jesus was a walking example of his father. That's why he said, if you have seen me, you have seen who? The father. Because what I do, the father also does. But the problem is, the world can't see the Father in Christians. Why? Because the Christians are acting like the world. That's why we're still here. That's why Jesus has not come yet. So what is our true identity? If you look at yourself, you're going to be discouraged. Because we're imperfect human beings. But if we look at Christ, we will always be encouraged. I don't care anymore too much what people think about me. Yes, I may be a little overweight. But I want to tell you what God says. I will praise thee, Psalm 139 verse 14. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well man looketh on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart Jeremiah 1 verse 4 to 5 the Lord hath appeared of old unto me saying yea I have loved thee what and with loving kindness have I drawn thee so our identity is we are fearfully and wonderfully made and we are loved. Do you feel unlovable at times? Have someone in your life maybe put you down and you feel like you're not worthy of love? Well, the Bible says we are loved with a love that has no beginning and it has no end. And by the way, it has no stopping point either. Just because you fall doesn't mean God loves you any less. And just because you try to do things won't make God love you anymore. God loves you because that is who he is. Jeremiah 31, 3. I just read that one. John 1, verse 12, excuse me. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. My friends, we are children of God. We're not orphans. The Bible says we're not bastards. You know what a bastard is? Someone who doesn't have a father. We've been adopted. We've been chosen. We are special in God's eyes. John 16, verse 27, the words of Christ. For the Father himself does what? Loveth you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Romans 8, 14 to 17. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of what? 
God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. We've been adopted. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if the children of God, then we're heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And then 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. God has handpicked us to do a special thing in these last days. A royal priesthood. A peculiar nation. Excuse me, people. That you should do what? Show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are chosen. We belong to royalty. We have a call to holiness. We are a people who are different. We don't eat like the world does. We don't listen to the music the world does. We don't talk the way the world does. We shouldn't even think the way the world does. We shouldn't have recreation that the world does. Why? Because we belong to royalty. And those things, not that we're better than those people, but those kind of things are beneath us. Why? Because our kingdom is not of this world. No, when you start teaching standards, I can tell you what's going to happen. In the last days when God's people start to lift up his standard, you know what you're going to be known as? A legalist. Don't judge me. Don't tell me how I'm supposed to live my life. I'm not judging you. That's what the God, God's word does. But the Bible also says, by your fruits you shall what? Know them. God has not called us to live however we want to live. We are called to live a holy life after the pattern of Jesus Christ. And I say this lovingly to people. If you don't believe in the doctrines and the teachings that this church was founded on, lovingly have the respect and the dignity to not corrupt other people and discourage other people. If you don't believe in this message with all your heart and all your soul, why are you here? I say it with love because I care about other people too. We have babies who come into this church, babies, Christians, and they look around and see what other people are doing and they thought man I didn't know this was going on how do I know because I was one of those people I looked around and I saw people acting different than what I expected yes people are imperfect but we are also called to be different and I don't want you to think I'm angry this morning I'm actually happy I'm a happy person but sometimes you have to tell the truth to people and the truth isn't necessarily always going to make you happy but it will if you decide to keep it keep you close to Christ in closing I want to share a story that illustrates my sermon this morning a story was shared of a terrible time when countless people were sent to Nazi concentration camps and at the train terminal one of these, at one of these death camps, the SS, or the, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Schutzhoffel, or protection squads as they were known, began separating able-bodied men from the women and children. One of the fathers there, who was going to be separated from his family, was the member of a royal family. And he realized immediately that he might never see his son again. So before the guards came over, he knelt down beside the boy, and held him by the shoulders. And he said, Michael, no matter what happens to me or to you, I want you to remember one thing. You are special. You are the son of a king. Soon, father and son were separated by the soldiers. 
they were marched off to two different sections of the camp, and the two never saw each other again. Michael learned much later that his father had perished in a gas chamber, and now he had to go out alone in the world and fend for himself. But it was his father's last words that he would always carry with him. You're the son of a king. My friends, we are the children of God. And it doesn't matter what happens to us in this life. That fact does not change. The world will hate you. They will despise you. You will even at times hate yourself. But you know, there's a Bible verse that I've clung to. And the Bible says, and it's from 2 Timothy, when we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of chasing pretty rainbows. I'm tired of trying to find my identity and my worth and what people think about me and what the world thinks and teaches. I'm trying to find, tr tired of trying to find it in, excuse me, politics. I'm tired of trying to find it in my religion. Brothers and sisters, we all try to find our worth and our value in different things. Food, sex, whatever it may be, addictions. But at the end of the day, there's still that emptiness within us. Why? Because we've been created for something more, something better. So my appeal to you is, why don't you bring those broken and shattered dreams of your life and at the feet of Jesus, lay them down. The invitation is to come. Come with your lack of faith. Come with your failures and broken promises. Come with your addictions and your insecurities and fears, your tears of abandonment and your desire for true love. Come and lay them at the feet of Jesus and watch him turn your sorrows into joy. Because I am a witness of this, for I once was an outcast, a stranger on earth, a sinner by choice, and an alien by birth. But the good news is I've been adopted and my name's written down. And now I am an heir to a mansion, a robe, and a crown. If it is your desire to claim your true identity in Christ this morning, I want you to stand as we sing our closing song number 468, I'm a child of the King. Number 468, I'm a child of the king.
you to know this morning that there is someone who cares when you're left all alone. There's someone who cares when your hope seems all gone. There's someone who cares and he's loved you all along for that someone who cares is Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven we thank you that we no longer have to be identified by what we've done, by what other people think about us. But Lord, our identity rests in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Help us walk in that today. Help us to realize that we belong to royalty. We are loved. We have been chosen. And no matter what happens, instead of listening to Satan's lies, may we believe in every word of God. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.